Welcome to CSAC's Director's Seminar. I'm Rod Ewing, one of the uh, co-directors, and it's my honor and pleasure today to welcome Sig Hecker back to CSAC. Um, I think most of you know of his uh, uh, accomplishments, uh, but for those who don't, let me just say a few words. Uh, Sig was uh, director of Los Alamos National Laboratory from 1986 to 1997. Uh, he first came to CSAC in 2005, I think on a sabbatical for one year. Uh, the good match between Sig's interest and accomplishments and CSAC was immediately obvious. And he served as a co-director from 2007 to uh, 2012. Um, just a few years ago, he became a uh, emeritus, uh, but we still are happy to claim him as one of our own, and we're particularly happy to have him back to report on his new book. Uh, Sig has been recognized in many ways for his accomplishments. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He received the enriched Enrico Fermi Award of uh, the Department of Energy. Uh, he's received the uh, uh, Eisenhower uh, Medal and the Glenn Seaborg Medal of the American Nuclear Society uh, for his work both in science and in policy. So with that, Dick, it's all yours. Just one uh, small point to those of you who are streaming in, uh, if you have questions, be sure to submit them to the Q&A section and I'll mix uh, those in with the questions from the audience at the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Rod. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, such a delight to see so many familiar faces uh, and it's great for me to be back uh, at CSAC. And a particular honor to be able to talk uh, about uh, the book uh, and this particular book uh, of uh, Hinge Points, an inside look at North Korea's nuclear program, uh, which I wrote with one Elliot Serban, who was invited to be here, uh, but Elliot is, is just toughing it out to finish a combination uh, of a JD uh, at Harvard along with a master's uh, at Belfer Center. And so he's uh, very busy finishing up, uh, but he worked with me uh, in the book. And so um, uh, we, uh, uh, we worked on this together and he was a terrific help. So it's a great pleasure to try to explain uh, sort of this puzzle that we have of this tiny little country uh, on half of the Korea Peninsula. You know, how did it become, uh, you know, such a nuclear threat. Uh, and particularly as we look at it, you know, over the last 30 years, uh, US presidents have tried and, and all of them have failed. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you can see from the Clinton era, uh, North Korea did not yet uh, develop a nuclear weapon, uh, but they kept ahead. Uh, during the George W. Bush, administration, they actually made the breakthrough and got a nuclear weapon and most likely had five or six or at least enough fissile materials for five or six by the time he left office. The Obama administration uh, also failed for different reasons in different ways. By the time President Obama left office, they may have had enough fissile materials for 20 to 25 weapons. Uh, in comes President Trump, you know, who threatened with fire and fury, and then they held hands and exchanged love letters uh, together, but in the end also failed, and they may have wound up, you know, with 45 or, or so nuclear weapons. And particularly during the last 20 years, that is the last three administrations, essentially none of these, for different reasons, actually believed that North Korea was ever serious uh, in trying to reach sort of accommodation with the United States and serious about diplomacy. But, but in the end, uh, they all failed. So here's more or less the synopsis uh, of my book to try to capture it is, and, and that is uh, in 1990, 
So in the language of actually Zachary Shore, which I learned about him after I finished the book, but it just fit as Zachary Shore down at Naval Postgraduate School, also at Berkeley, of looking at patterns and pattern changes. So there was a pattern change in North Korea behavior. And that is Kim Il-sung, as the Cold War was ending, uh, decided to seek normalization uh, with the United States to sort of balance that against possibly hostile China and Russia. But he chose what I call a dual track policy. And that is to try to achieve normalization through diplomacy. But since North Korea always felt as a tiny small country, you can never you know, leave your future to somebody else. So also make sure you develop nuclear weapons in case diplomacy fails. So dual track, it was diplomacy and weaponization. And then I maintain, and I try to develop this in, in the book, is that all three of the Kims, from the grandfather Kim Il-sung down through Kim Jong-il and now Kim Jong-un, pursued that normalization at one time or another during their tenures. But because they were developing the nuclear weapons along in this dual track policy, that certain advances in their nuclear capabilities then led to key decision points that I call hinge points. And at those hinge points, the three administrations, Bush, Obama, and Trump, they failed to make what I call technically informed risk management decisions. Elizabeth, I learned that in MSNE. And so that then wound up resulting in more of an arsenal and greater risks and what we face in the Korean Peninsula today. So that's sort of the essence of the book. I try to develop that. And uh, you might ask the question, well, why in the world would I know? You know, I, I'm just a technical guy. You know, as Rod said, I come from Los Alamos National Laboratory. I spent 34 years there. So why would I know? How would I be able to develop this? And that's my story here today. So it's not only that I encourage you very much to read the book, uh, but I also want to tell the story that it was this environment of my coming uh, to Stanford uh, in 2005. So the CSAC environment, and I'm going to describe that in more detail, and I'm going to show that through the course of telling the story of the book as to how that was important. And in fact, it wasn't just CSAC, and in fact, I did see this photo is still out here on the wall someplace. It's one of my favorite photos of Bill Perry, uh, uh, Scott Sagan, and myself uh, after uh, I came uh, to CSAC. But it was more than just CSAC. And particularly, it was also Gibo Chin and A Park. And what I learned through A Park and the connections to the world through A Park. And then Elizabeth Pate Cornell through MSNE, Management Science Engineering, because that's where I had a co-appointment, learning about risk analysis. And so that's the Stanford environment, which I think gave me the sort of background, the experience. Uh, it allowed me to continue to learn as I was going along, uh, working the North Korea problem. Of course, work uh, along with trying to work the rest of the nuclear problems uh, in the world. So it was the CSAC faculty, my colleagues. It was the affiliates that, that CSAC has and continues to have uh, that bring in all of these different capabilities and experiences, the visiting faculty and scholars, and then the fellows uh, and the students. At APARC, similarly, again, if you look at who's been here at APARC, who I've had a chance to interact with, the affiliates, the visitors, uh, and then, as I'll point out, the South Korea connections, particularly through Giwok, MSNE, as I mentioned, the faculty, students. And then for me, it was actually teaching also. That was so important, teaching the two, the big class, which was MSNE 193, 293, and then the small seminar style class, because that's why I tried to explain. When I come back from North Korea, I try to explain to them, try to explain as to what it means. And as you try to explain that, you learn yourself as to how to say it better and do it better. 
So it was this environment uh, that over 20 years time, essentially from 2004, which is the first time I went to North Korea that really did this. But above all, in terms of my North Korea activity here uh, at CSAC, it was this man, uh, you know, John Wilson Lewis. And of course, as you know, John was a very special uh, individual, a very intent uh, individual. And of course, early in his career, you know, he was a Vietnam protester. He was a reach out to China, but he also reached out to North Korea. Uh, and in fact, that's how I got to, to North uh, Korea. In fact, you know, in terms of this pattern change of when the North Koreans first started to reach across, it was John Lewis was involved in that. In 1990, he had North Koreans that visited here. Uh, and, um, and John set up uh, continued meetings in 1990. They met with, with Bill Perry here. And then for his ninth trip, when he was invited in the end of 2003, uh, as the so-called agreed framework, the Clinton era deal fell apart, uh, he invited me to come along. Uh, and as I tell in the book, I said, John, I don't wanna go to North Korea. You know, I've been in Russia, I've been in China, I've been in all these other nuclear places. I don't wanna go to North Korea. Well, as you know, those of you who knew John, he didn't take no for an answer. I finally thought, well, my chances are that, first of all, I was still at Los Alamos. I said, our government is never gonna let me go. Uh, well, there were a few people, including uh, one Tom Finger, uh, who happened to be in INR and the State Department at the time, and Linton Brooks over in the Department of Energy. And those two in Washington, he said, hey, why don't we let them go? Maybe we'll learn something. Most of the rest of the Bush administration is suddenly like, no way in hell is Jack are gonna go. But I went uh, and then I thought, well, for sure, the North Koreans, when they find out he's an ex-director of Los Alamos, they're gonna come and visit our nuclear facilities. They never allow it. Well, I was wrong. And so I wound up in North Korea. And so what I tried to show in the book is here, this is my visiting their nuclear facilities in 2004. And they, indeed, they opened up the nuclear complex at Yang Dian. And so there it was the Los Alamos effect to go with the CSAC effect. So I knew the technical stuff. You know, I'd worked there since I was a summer student in 1965. So when they took us there, we processing facility to spend fuel pool. Uh, and they talked to me, we talked the technical stuff. I had an understanding. So that's what I've been trying to do since 2004 is to bring together the technical aspects and the political developments hand in hand and side by side. And that's what uh, I think uh, was able to give me uh, some insight that I tried to share uh, in the book. So now to take you through a bit of the history and I'm gonna do this uh, uh, pretty quickly, but to give you an idea of a couple of these hinge points uh, and what it meant and what I mean by the US government making the wrong calls. So the first deal, and, and Bill, I, I took this photo from the official photo they had of you as SEC DEF uh, in, in 1994. So uh, the Clinton administration uh, managed to get this deal, the agreed framework. Uh, and uh, as you can uh, read from here, it was to replace these gas graphite or graphite moderated reactors, which were good for making plutonium, but not very good for making electricity. Uh, with electricity producing reactors, the light water reactors. Uh, but the key part was it was gonna be full normalization of economic and political relations along with them giving up the plutonium uh, uh, program in, in North Korea. But it, it turns out from 1994 when it started, there was also an election in November of 1994 where the Republicans uh, retook both uh, the um, uh, the Congress, the the whole Congress, the the House uh, and the Senate, uh, and made it pretty difficult from the American side of sticking with the agreed framework. Well, the North Koreans also had their own ideas. They were doing dual tracks, so there were lots of problems along the way. And then there was one Bill Perry who thought he got out of the government finally, and they brought him back into the government uh, for what's called the Perry process. And for those of you. Uh, you, you know, who know about diplomacy and how you work outside of the government. This is a perfect example of how Bill, having left uh, the government, coming back in, 
to examine what do we do now uh, you know, with North Korea. Uh, and I, I invite those of you uh, who haven't studied the agreed framework much to read uh, the Perry process report and, and what Bill did uh, to uh, actually after he did his work to go to North Korea, but then in the United States. Uh, and he said, look, we got to deal with North Korea uh, the way it is, not the way we want it to be. Bill, the, our government still hasn't taken that advice <laughs> you know, some almost 20 years uh, later. However, at that time, it turned the corner uh, on the agreed framework. Uh, and here actually is Bill Perry uh, hosting uh, one of the, the highest ranking military member from North Korea out here in the Bay Area, uh, Marshal, Vice Marshal Cho, who then went to the White House, uh, met with Bill Clinton, uh, and they signed a joint statement. And, and less than two months later, Madeleine Albright uh, was over holding hands with Kim Jong-il. And things at that point looked pretty good. And I remember Bill telling me a couple of times when we lectured together in our class, uh, is he said, I thought we were a few months away you know, from actually making a, a breakthrough. Uh, but then something else happened. There was an election uh, and um, the uh, Bush team took over. Uh, including, you know, some pretty hardliners on, on the defense end, Vice President Cheney, Sec. Def Rumsfeld, uh, and then John Bolton. Uh, and in essence, they were having none of this agreed framework and holding hands with the North Koreans. They thought that was a monumental uh, mistake. What also happened at the same time as part of this tool track activity, the North Koreans had shut down the plutonium complex, as I'm going to show you in a second. But uh, they were clandestinely developing the second path to the bomb, and that is uranium enrichment. Uh, and it turns out even the Clinton administration already knew that, uh, but they hadn't yet made it public for a number of reasons of not giving away methods and sources. Uh, but when the Clinton administration found out about the uranium path, it's best said by John Bolton actually in his book, and the book is appropriately uh, titled Surrender is Not an Option. He said uranium enrichment was the hammer we needed to shatter the agreed framework. So they were just waiting you know, for the right thing to come along to say, we're, we're out of here. We're not going to do uh, this deal. And they did. Uh, they used the hammer. They walked away. And then, as far as I'm concerned, they sat idly by while North Korea built the bomb. And that was the hinge point. And so what, what I'm going to show you is actually to try to give you a little of the technical insight as to what strikes me as, as just being so much going in the wrong direction of not paying attention to the technical parts when you make a political decision. From a technical standpoint, this was a disaster. Because in essence, what they did, even though the North Koreans I will show you, were doing uranium enrichment uh, uh, you know, covertly that as soon as the Americans walked away from the agreed framework, they opened the door for the North Koreans to build the bomb. And so they traded one, the uranium enrichment, which would have taken 10 years to come to fruition for one that took six months. That's not a good technical trade-off. And so here, here's just to give you an example in terms of what happened on the plutonium front. What they should have known in October of 2002, and certainly Tom Finger knew that, uh, is they had this small reactor which was making plutonium, about one bomb's worth a year. They had a much larger reactor that was close uh, to being operational. They said a year and a half, but when I saw it, it probably was longer, but it would have come there. Then they had a much bigger reactor yet that would have, they would have made lots of plutonium. They had spent fuel that they had already run the reactor uh, for a number of years. They had that sitting in a pool and that spent fuel held plutonium. They had a reprocessing facility that had the ability to extract that plutonium. Uh, and then they had a fuel fab facility uh, that was in some disrepair, but they could have reconstituted that. So in other words, the administration knew that they had this capability in plutonium they could resurrect pretty quickly. And so that's the North Koreans then invited John Lewis to come back because they had made this decision uh, once 
the uh, American side shattered the agreed framework. They withdrew from the non-proliferation treaty. They restarted the whole complex. They reprocessed the, the plutonium. On this side, on the American side, we weren't quite sure as to whether they had actually reprocessed uh, or not. Uh, and nothing happened. And so the North Koreans actually invited John Lewis back to show him that, look, we did all of these things. We actually have this stuff. <laughs> uh, and then when they found out that I was coming along, not only did they say, hell no, they said, oh God, if Hecker comes, you know, we can actually get a real confirmation of the fact that the Americans must now believe that we have the bomb. And so here we are walking through their facilities uh, actually, it was remarkable access uh, that they gave us through the facilities. I had these incredible discussions with the North Koreans about plutonium, the phases of plutonium, the density of plutonium, and all of these things. Uh, and then at the end, they said, well, Dr. Hecker, you've now seen our deterrent. And I said, well, no, I've seen your facilities. And that's when they said, would you like to see our product? And I said, you mean the plutonium? We were sitting in a conference room like this, about half of this size, uh, and, and they said, well, yes. And so I said, sure, you know, I handled plutonium in 1965 when I was a 21-year-old student at Los Alamos, you know. You... So they waved out in the hallway. So obviously they, they didn't go for a long walk. They had it outside the hall, they brought it in. I wound up holding the plutonium in a glass jar, sealed right there, because they wanted to show me and quite frankly, once I saw that piece of plutonium, that shape that it had, which was a thin wall funnel shape, I said, if they can make that, they can make a bomb. And that's what, that's the message they wanted to get across. So from that visit, and then the follow-up visits, I went every year for seven years. What we were able, what I was able then do, and I, and I do this in the book, is essentially reconstruct. So this is what the government should have known. Here's what actually happened. Uh, yes, their little reactor was ready to operate. The two bigger ones, it took a couple of years to figure it out with them, uh, but they died. They essentially were not salvageable. Uh, the, um, the spent fuel pool, yes, it was easy to reprocess. They did, they reprocessed it, uh, and they managed to get the fuel fabrication back in operation. And here's one thing that still most of the pundits that look at North Korea still don't quite appreciate that the North Koreans, they lost this major plutonium production capacity because of the agreed framework. Those two big reactors died. And that means most of their plutonium production died and they've never resurrected that. And still today, you know, some almost 20 years later, their total plutonium inventory uh, might be on the order of 50 kilograms. It takes five or six kilograms for a bomb. That's all they have for, for plutonium. You know, just in comparison, the uh, United States at one time or another had 111,000 kilograms of plutonium and the Russians maybe 125 or 130,000 kilograms. Uh, they have 50, they could have been making close to 300 a year uh, if the agreed framework uh, wasn't there. Why they haven't recovered that, I still find that strange. And then there was this peculiar thing, even while they were allowing this plutonium complex to atrophy, uh, except for keeping the small one, uh, you know, in standby, they were building a reactor for Syria. And I'm gonna come back to that. Okay. So what about this, the bomb fuel? What about the uranium enrichment where they did the co uh, covert program? Well, uh, at that time, I, I would imagine that people like Tom Finger and others said, well, they suspected AQ Khan, uh, that the, the, the Pakistani uh, a scientist uh, who we found out later uh, here actually, uh, when he was arrested in Pakistan in 2004, that he did provide some centrifuges to the North Koreans and that he helped train the North Koreans uh, at the uh, Khan Research Laboratory. The procurements, uh, again, in 2002, they knew that, you know, there were enough signs that they were trying to buy high strength aluminum uh, from uh, Germany and from uh, Russia. Uh, centrifuges, they weren't quite sure exactly. And then this UX, UF6 uranium hexafluoride, uh, which is what you need for centrifuges, 
it turns out for their reactor business, they only need uranium tetrafluoride. Weren't quite sure as to what was there. Well, we found out later that yes, indeed, uh, the, you know, they had worked with AQCon, they had gotten some centrifuges from AQCon, and they actually had sold some of this uranium hexafluoride to Libya. So they had the capacity to do that, which uh, none of us knew uh, at that time. So they did have the, the capability as I indicate here. If we look at the rest of the business, like the weaponization part, you know, what about building the bomb? Uh, in October of 2002, these were mostly question marks. We had some indications that they had done what we call cold tests, so testing the explosives uh, for nuclear weapons, but we didn't know much else. Well, you know, once we were there, we talked to them in the next few years, it turns out they were doing all of these things. That was part of their dual track policy and their dual pack, uh, track strategy. So while they were shutting down the plutonium complex, were covertly looking at you know, sort of exploring the uranium, they kept these other capabilities uh, alive. And so when the Bush administration killed the agreed framework, these guys were ready. It didn't take them 10 years to go and you know, build a bomb, test a bomb. They did it in very short order. And so that's what made it so tragic that we made that decision and then just sat there. But of course, if you remember in 2003, there were also other things going on for the US government, namely in Iraq. Okay, so we left 2003, uh, John Lewis, you know, ever, you know, pushing things was back uh, in 2004, I should say, we left there. 2005, we were back because the North Koreans by that time, they said they had withdrawn from the non-proliferation treaty. And there were discussions in 2005, the North Koreans actually said, hey, look, we're interested uh, in, in coming back. And so uh, John and I and a couple of other uh, colleagues were there uh, in uh, 2005. This is uh, Vice Minister uh, Kim Gaiguan uh, was meeting with us and he was telling us, hey, look, we're interested in coming back, but you know, you guys had promised a light water reactor, which we never got to deliver. Uh, and we still want the light water reactor. But then one, for me, one of the really fascinating aspects uh, of, of going uh, to North Korea and going with, uh, with John particularly uh, was he was interested in everything. And so John was interested sort of in the comprehensive picture. If you're gonna go into a country, you not only have to try to focus on the nuclear program, you have to focus on the country. You got to understand the people, you got to understand the issues. So we wound up in school rooms, for example, in, in this middle school, uh, number one, and there's John with the students. I have a photo of myself with this young lady because I bent over and I looked at her notebook uh, and the notebook uh, was uh, a story about Thomas Alpha Edison, written in English, in almost calligraphy. It was just beautiful. Now here I am in North Korea and they told me, you know, this, this is sort of the dark hole on the political side, right? It's the hermit kingdom. And I visit a school and they're studying Thomas Alpha Edison. And, and then John was everywhere. Here we were at the Agricultural uh, uh, Academy of Sciences. We're out there looking at the crops and John was interested in everything, whether it was apple trees, whether it was corn or soybeans. Uh, and we visited many of these places. We also, because of the connections, and again, here are the CSAC connections, you know, once upon a time, Condoleezza Rice uh, was a fellow here uh, at, um, at CSAC. Uh, she worked uh, with uh, John Lewis and with others. And now, uh, in uh, September of 2005, she was Secretary of State. Uh, so John got us an appointment with Secretary Rice. And after our visit, we went to uh, visit uh, Secretary Rice. Uh, I gave her uh, a pitch of what we had seen in our interpretation. And we said, look, from our standpoint, it would really, we recommend that, you know, give them the possibility of a light water reactor of nuclear energy. It would seem to make sense to us. Uh, I gave her you know, a technical description of the dangers of the fuel cycles for light water reactors versus the gas graphite reactors they had. 
Uh, and we also said, look, and the North Koreans are willing to do a lot to make sure that you're comfortable with the light water reactors. They, they said, you can even operate them if you want to until you're comfortable you know, with us uh, operating those. Uh, but then at one point in one of the dinners, I managed to tweak Vice Minister Kim just in the wrong way, I gather, from whatever I said uh, about nuclear weapons. And he told me uh, what's here in red. You know, he said, our countries are still in a ceasefire state of war. If you can make a bomb out of five kilograms of plutonium, so can we. If you can mount a missile, so can we. And if you can fit it in the backpack, I thought that one was really over the top. You know, I said, so can we. Uh, but uh, in the end, he said, look, no light water reactor, no deal. We came back, we told that to Secretary uh, Rice. Uh, she sent me to talk to Bob Joseph, who very smart guy, a very hardline guy. <laughs> and Bob wasn't having uh, any of this, but it turns out uh, Secretary of Rice, uh, Rice then actually managed to get the six party talks, which were the, the four neighbors, US and, and North Korea, uh, to agree in this September 19, 2005 statements uh, were uh, actually uh, one, a Chinese colleague of John Lewis actually helped uh, to draft uh, that statement. Uh, and the North Koreans were willing to come back and normalize relations, uh, promote the economic relations, et cetera. And then the LWR uh, deal, and Secretary Rice also told me that afterwards, uh, our, re our report back had given her enough leeway within the government that the agreement, the joint statement actually said, and we would consider an LWR at an appropriate time in the future. And that's what uh, allowed the six party statement uh, to be signed. That was the good news. The bad news was that almost simultaneously, the US then issued a unilateral statement aside from the six party statement, which walked back almost every aspect of this. So at that point, the North Koreans said, hey, we're out of here. So another hinge point, you know, it was, uh, and also in addition to walking back, there were also the sanctions from the treasury department. Then what I found later uh, is that Bob Joseph actually to one of his uh, uh, South Korean uh, colleagues uh, had said, and no LWR until pigs fly. Uh, so the LWR was out, another hinge point. They walk away, North Koreans walk away uh, again. Uh, and then uh, in 2006, they test uh, the first nuclear device. They did it shortly after uh, a, a long range missile test in, in July uh, 5th of 2006. It's actually one bill where you remember you and Ash Carter, uh, you wrote an op-ed piece and essentially say, take it out, <laughs> you know, take out the missile. Uh, before uh, they, they shoot it off. Uh, the US government didn't do that. Uh, the North Koreans uh, went through and did the first nuclear test and that changed everything. So we had a couple of hinge points, uh, North Koreans, then when they were not in dialogue, they were making significant progress on, the, on their nuclear program. Okay, I spent a lot of time on this. I'm gonna walk through the rest faster. So they did test uh, in 2006 and lo and behold, Here's John Lewis always angling to go back to North Korea. And we were two, there two weeks after they did their first nuclear test. They met with us and the bottom line was, hey, uh, it worked and we're filled with pride. Again, being a nuclear guy, you know, <clears throat> we did a lot of nuclear tests at uh, Los Alamos. And, and I said, well, uh, Director Lee, it didn't seem to work that well <laughs> uh, because all indications from the seismic signals that we were able to monitor uh, at that, actually, initially, it looked like maybe a few tenths of a kiloton. Uh, and in the end, uh, I think eventually, it wound up to be um, the assessment closer to a kiloton. But, but that's still, uh, as my Chinese colleagues, I will tell you the Chinese connection in a minute, they said, well, they told us they're gonna do four kilotons. Uh, one kiloton, well, that's not perfect, but it's not bad. And I said, so if they can get one kiloton, uh, they can make a bomb. Uh, and they did. And then in 2000, now here we are in, going into 2007. And this again is one of the most remarkable things 
uh, of John Lewis. He had the key North Korean diplomats here. Uh, and they were going to come to Stanford. And then John said, no, we're going to have uh, a too big uh, a fuss here at Stanford. And he managed the inn at Saratoga. Uh, and Givo Chen remembers that because he was there along with me and others. And, and John managed to get FBI help, usher the vice minister and Madam Che you know, from the airport, from the tarmac, and get them over to the inn uh, of uh, Saratoga, where we spent a couple of days uh, working with them before they went to Washington. Uh, and, and let me just tell you again, the, the discussions with them, the interaction, the things that you learn from the face-to-face -face interaction, you know, and again, we pushed them uh, on, the, um, on the uranium enrichment because the North Koreans denied. They said, we don't have any uranium enrichment, you know, and so I would, I would push back. And then finally, you know, over a glass of red wine, Vice Minister Kim would say, you know, that uranium enrichment, that's my biggest headache, uh, you know, because in essence, he couldn't uh, uh, get things squared away in his own government as to what they were willing to say, what they're willing to do. Uh, and then later in 2007, uh, we're back over in North Korea. You can see their very informal shirts. It was just hot and humid, almost like Washington DC uh, in the August time frame. It also rained like the Dickens when we were going back out uh, to the nuclear facility. But before doing that again in John Lewis's way, we went, this is the only time I was scared in North Korea. We went to the TB lab. And here I'm a nuclear guy. I know how to monitor you know, for nuclear stuff. How do I monitor for tuberculosis? But John was interested because the North Koreans had this big uh, you, you know, uh, medication resistant uh, tuberculosis problem. So we went to the TB lab number three. This is Bob Carlin here, who was a longtime compatriot of John Lewis and has been uh, my close colleague. And then uh, next uh, year, early next January, uh, actually, John arranged for the Bay Area Tuberculosis Consortium uh, to welcome the North Korean medical people here. So we actually had the North Korean medical people here, and they, John took them through all of these different places in the Bay Area as to how we treat uh, the, the issue and how we uh, deal with, uh, with North Korea. So that was early 2008 and 2007 and 2008. This was actually a time where the North Koreans had then agreed. This was now in the latter part of the Bush administration uh, where he had ambassador Chris Hill working with the North Koreans and they got back to an agreement. And the agreement was that the North Koreans would do disable their nuclear facilities at Yongbyon in the eventual way to get towards dismantlement. Uh, and so the uh, international inspectors uh, were allowed to come back in, American technical teams got back in, and we got back in. And here I am in their plutonium uh, laboratory, uh, also looking at some of the dismantlement activities they did. Uh, and then um, uh, in June, just for good measure, the North Koreans actually blew up the cooling tower for that little reactor. Uh, as it turns out later on, they eventually, as we said then, you, you know, they replaced uh, the cooling tower by going directly uh, to the river. Uh, so in 2007, 2008, then there was actually back some collaboration and some hope that one might be able to uh, ride the diplomatic uh, process out. But what also happened during the same time, and th this is this sort of incredibly frustrating thing in dealing with the North Koreans, trying to understand as to what they're doing, you know, the dual track, I got a pretty good sense that they're going dual track. But then in addition to dual track, they also wanted to make sure they had money. Uh, and so they would sell missiles and they sold missiles, you know, all over the Middle East. And then here they were doing this thing. This is the most egregious thing, in my opinion, the North Koreans actually did. They built uh, a plutonium production reactor for Syria. Uh, and even the Israeli Mossad uh, intelligence service didn't know that until very late, until 2007 timeframe. And they probably started this somewhere in 2001 uh, or so timeframe. So while they were working with us, they were indeed doing things like this uh, Syria reactor. Uh, this is the reactor, doesn't look like a reactor, but it was a reactor. 
Israelis bombed it in September of 2007. And here's one of the places where, again, the CSAC environment was so incredible. It was a time where shortly thereafter, so we had Frank Pabian, the Los Alamos scientist, uh, one of the best image analysts uh, in the world, uh, come and work with us here for a year. So, so he was a Los Alamos visiting scientist. And then Frank put together this thing and he said, hey, one of the reasons nobody spotted this thing, first of all, instead of having fencing all around it, there were no fences, there was nothing. There was just this thing. And this thing looked a lot like these old Byzantine fortresses that were in that area. So it looked like just another one. It was bigger, but, it, but it's very, very similar. Uh, and indeed, uh, Israelis wound up destroying it. Okay, so 2000, uh, and eight. So this was another potential high point uh, in terms of diplomacy. Uh, and, and Bill Perry uh, remembers this well. I've heard him talk about it. And that is when the New York Philharmonic uh, went to Pyongyang uh, and Lauren Mazel uh, was there. It was spectacular performance. Bill sat in the audience. And at the end, when, when he was uh, uh, interviewed, uh, he said, as he does uh, so often in these meaningful things, you cannot demonize people when you're sitting there listening to their music. And you don't go to war with people unless you demonize them first. So this was another one of those times where it looked like there might just be this possibility to kick the diplomatic uh, uh, process uh, over the top. But it was not to be. Uh, in 2008, uh, the Bush administration, even there were people like Chris Hill working like the Dickens to come to closure with the North Koreans, to take the next steps on verification. There were other parts of the Bush administration that were pushing so damn hard on the verification part that the North Koreans started to go back. And then what the Bush administration didn't quite seem to appreciate uh, was that in August uh, of 2008, uh, Kim Jong-il suffered uh, a debilitating stroke and, and almost died. Uh, and, and that changed everything from the North Korean side because then succession planning really became the most uh, important thing. And so even though you know, they came close, uh, we had several opportunities to try to get there, uh, but then uh, it didn't happen. And then as I'll tell you in 2009, uh, you know, there was a rocket launch, but that's part of the next uh, story. The, the bottom line of this story is that Bush administration tried to reach across, almost got there, but then things fell apart uh, in late 2008. In other words, time ran out. 2009, we were back again uh, with, uh, with John Lewis uh, in, uh, in Pyongyang. Uh, and, and this was the most disappointing of the visits. And again, in terms of people who were there, this is David Straub, uh, who was at APARC, uh, I think just more or less had started APARC. Uh, Paul Carroll from Plowshares, and actually Marjorie Kiewit, who funded much of, of John's work, John and, and Bob Carlin. Uh, we were there, and, and the bottom line was, uh, hey, look, I always ask, why am I here? <laughs> and I said, we want you to tell the press we're suspending this disablement. We're going to be out of here. And we all said, no, no, wait a minute. We got a new president. He said, I will reach out my hand if you unclench your fist. Uh, you know, you're going to hit him right in the face with your fist. Yeah, yeah. Why do you want to do that? Uh, essentially said, you don't know how bad it's going to get. So before I finish that story, let me bring in another angle. And this is the China angle. Uh, and again, why it's so important in trying to understand countries like North Korea or any country, get other countries, get other people's perspectives. And so John had the connection uh, with the, um, actually it's pretty good connection with the military and then also uh, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so in this 2009 visit, we always stopped in China on the way back because the flights go uh, Pyongyang to Beijing. We met with the foreign ministry. Uh, I'd had uh, uh, connections with the nuclear complex uh, of the Chinese nuclear complex since the early 1990s. And I'd been over there a number of times, including in, in their Los Alamos. So whenever we came back, we'd compare notes uh, on our assessments as to what's happening in the North Korean uh, nuclear complex. And we did it again uh, at that particular visit. And then this young Shi Yu, he, he's the person who crafted 
uh, the six party statement in, in January uh, of 2005. And lo and behold, John Lewis is able to bring young Shi Yu over here to CSAC as a fellow. Uh, and he was here for six months working with us. And that guy had insight to North Korea. That was just incredible. I, I taught one of the classes in MSNE 193293 with young Shi Yu. And, and here, this is sort of one of his uh, uh, view graphs. So he says, what does China want out of this? Well, it wants permanent peace and stability and a denuclearized Korean peninsula. And I think at that time that was true. His view, what does the US want? First and foremost, denuclearize North Korea uh, and lasting non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. In other words, the Americans seem to be only interested in the nuclear part. But what does North Korea want? Well, they want guarantee of their security by commanding a nuclear deterrent. They want the nuclear uh, deterrent and engage with the US for setting up strategic relations with the US. So he had that figured out. Most people in the United States didn't have that figured out or didn't believe it. It's also important to pay attention to the Russian view. And I've done that. I've been in Russia many, many times. And I've probably discussed North Korea with them in a dozen or so visits. Uh, here's one of their perspectives. It's actually uh, in a publication, uh, but it captures what I hear from my Russian colleagues. Again, use it. Why do they want nuclear weapons? Use them as a diplomatic card to bring US to the bargaining table. And so if you think about why in the world would they show me, take me through their plutonium facilities? Why would they show me? Why would they tell me all of these things? They obviously weren't trying to hide them. They were actually trying to show them. And to a large extent, again, my view of that is they were trying to get the attention of the US government is look, we'd like to come to an accommodation. Of course, they'd like to do it on their terms. And then the problem with the hinge points is whenever we did engage, we never engaged long enough to make the right decision to actually test them as to whether we could get to that point. And obviously, uh, we have. So what happened then in 2009, Obama's uh, speech, big time speech uh, in Prague. Uh, and he included it in his speech. And he said, North Korea broke the rules once more by testing a rocket that could be used for a long range missile. Uh, and then he goes on. And this is where this again turned out to be a hinge point because at that point, the North Koreans uh, were actually um, in sufficient diplomatic uh, sort of a, approach with us that we had the technical people in there, the IAEA. Then they actually said, are we going to build our own light water reactor and for light water reactors, we need enrichment. So we're going to build an enrichment facility. And so when we saw that and then reported back to Vice Minister uh, Li Young Ho uh, on the final night dinner, he said, you know, we told you guys we're, we're going to do, and nobody believed us, uh, including you. What I saw was, was mind blowing. Uh, you know, I thought I was going to see a few old rickety um, uh, centrifuges instead, they showed us this modern, you know, 2000 centrifuge facility. 
Uh, and now again, you could ask why? Well, this time they got the message through me. Uh, and of course, it, it, you know, every newspaper in the country and almost in the world had this thing as North Korea now admits a, a, a centrifuge uh, facility because they were telling the American government, hey, we have both paths to the bomb now. And for uranium, you'll never know how much we have because it's easy to hide. And so that was the message. Again, the Stanford environment then, we had Frank Pabian uh, close by. I put together this sketch uh, of, of what I saw. And, and by the way, you know, to this day, there's still the three of us, Bob, Bob uh, Carlin, John Lewis, and myself are the only ones who've ever been in their centrifuge facility. We were rushed through there. I tried to learn as much as I possibly can, but everything we know, this country knows about the centrifuge facilities is from that visit. Uh, and we have to make certain assumptions, so we're not sure, uh, and that's why we estimate. Uh, anyway, we I took this. Uh, Frank Pabian then makes a sketch up three, uh, uh, you know, of this, and of course those things were all over everywhere. Then the whole uh, satellite imagery team uh, that we had here at CSAC was so fantastic. You know, from Frank who came, uh, Alison Puccioni who was an affiliate and I think still is. Uh, and then a whole number of young scholars who from uh, these professionals learned how to do satellite imagery. Uh, and then we had experts in every one of the nuclear physics. Heim Brown was here, he knows reactors better than almost anybody. Nick Hansen, who's here? Nick Hansen knows uh, about missiles. Lou Franklin also, and then many of the scholars uh, and visitors we had. So one, they were able to put together things like this. That's the experimental light water reactor that the North Koreans then decided to build themselves. So we can all get all the way from what we saw was here. 2013, they essentially finished the outside. By the way, it's still not operating. So on the plutonium and, and the electricity side, for 20 years, uh, it's been a failure. Missiles, they shoot off left and right. Um, nuclear testing, again, Frank Pabian was here. I know a little bit about nuclear testing. When they did their first uh, couple of nuclear tests, we had it all figured out as to where were they testing, you know, to give us the best chance uh, of trying to understand uh, what the, um, the yields were. Uh, Nick Hansen followed, you know, day and night, all of their missile site developments and everything else. And so we kept track of that. Okay, then another, uh, uh, hinge point in the Obama administration was that uh, actually in 2011, after all of these things, 2009, 2010, uh, North Koreans came back and actually said, hey, we're, we're willing to talk. This is still Kim Jong-il with Stephen Bosworth and company from uh, the, um, uh, the Obama administration. Uh, and then uh, Kim Jong-il dies in December. A uh, young man, Kim Jong-un takes over. Uh, and lo and behold, he sticks with the sort of deal they put together, it's called the leap day uh, agreement. But again, and I explain all of this in the book and I encourage you to read the book because we have, I have all the details uh, in there. Again, here it turns out that the, the, uh, there was no joint statement. There were two statements and the Korean statement, the American statements differed somewhat. The Korean said, it's okay to test rockets. The American said, no, 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 that's a missile. You can't test the missile. Well, they tested a rocket uh, on, um, uh, in, in, in 2012, uh, the Americans walked away and it was a hinge point. And we could have had the chance, and, and I was there with our government. I would say, hey, no, no, give us a chance to get back into that centrifuge facility. We need to really see what's in there and what they have, uh, but we didn't get back in because they decided not to go. The MS&E part, so how much do they have in terms of uranium enrichment? We don't know. So Elizabeth, her students, and I uh, put our heads together. Uh, and of course, that's what they know how to do in MSNE, a Bayesian model, a probabilistic model. to try to take everything into account as to what they need to build centrifuges, where they could have gotten it from, and then make the best estimate as to how many centrifuges could they have. That's what we put together. And we said, we don't care where it is because we, we saw the centrifuge facility that I visited. They doubled it uh, in uh, about another three years. But then 
I, I reported when I came back, they have to have another centrifuge facility someplace. They can't possibly, you know, make one like that in a building that I had visited, uh, you know, one year earlier. So, but it didn't matter. We just put it all together and we came up with saying, well, maybe around 175 kilograms a year. That's still our best uh, of highly enriched uranium that they could make. And that's probably still our best uh, estimate. Okay. Then, so they wouldn't let me into North Korea anymore after 2010, so I went to South Korea. Uh, and most of the time I went with a part. Uh, and that is that uh, Giwok had this ROK US West Coast set of meetings. Fantastic meetings, you know, of American expertise, South Korean expertise. Uh, we went over there a number of times. I learned a lot. And, and then uh, John Lewis started these Korea discussion groups once we couldn't go over there anymore. Again, people from here, uh, people from Europe, uh, uh, people from uh, uh, the US government, uh, uh, STRATCOM, Strategic Command, uh, participated in that. And, and we had those every year until the, the pandemic. Uh, and in fact, we had people like Kathy Zellweger, uh, who was um, uh, a humanitarian worker uh, who lived in, in North Korea for a number of years and just knew so much about what's in the inside of North Korea. Again, that all uh, you know helped uh, to tell us what's going on. Okay, let me finish up the Obama years. Uh, uh, the Obama years that I explain in the book went somewhere from what they call strategic uh, patience uh, to benign neglect. Uh, and so in other words, it just wasn't much done. They seemed to sort of cross President Obama with that first um, uh, rocket launch and then a second rocket launch and nobody just was able to capture uh, and work with the North Koreans anymore. And what happened, they did four more nuclear tests during Obama's time. Uh, these are the number of missile tests. They did a whole bunch of missile tests. They really came of age uh, during the Obama administration. Okay, then comes President Trump. And 2007 was a very scary year, very dangerous year. Of course, you know, he had no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Uh, Kim Jong-un replied, but then interestingly, and I developed this in the book, 2017, while he was launching uh, missiles, showing nuclear weapons, he calls this a thermonuclear, two-stage thermonuclear bomb. Uh, and it turns out the one they tested in 2017, we don't know if it was that bomb, but it was a big bomb, you know, most likely uh, a hydrogen bomb. Uh, here, uh, again, this sort of analysis of the six tests that they did uh, all depends uh, on my visits there, my knowledge of what goes on in the nuclear world, and then discussions with the Chinese uh, and with the Russians. The missile stuff, you know, I let uh, Nick Hansen, uh, you know, he can tell you they lofted these ICBMs, but they can reach uh, the United States. So in uh, 2018, Bob Carlin, uh, and Elliot uh, Servin and I put together this chart. Uh, and the chart uh, was the attempt to bring the technical and the diplomatic and actually economic aspects together uh, of how the North Korean program developed over the years. Uh, and we developed the concept that we tried to bring into the Trump administration to say, hey, look, they've got all of this capability, but we have to do, the only chance we have is to get him to halt, eventually roll back, and then, you know, in the long term, eliminate the nuclear program. There's just no way you're going to go in and surgically say they're going to denuclearize. It's not going to happen. Well, Trump did uh, hold a summit because it turns out both he and Kim Jong un in 2017 actually reached across to the other side and said, We're ready to talk. The, the fact that Trump actually did this in, in December of 2017 was not known until reasonably. Uh, recently, but he reached across, oops, he reached across through Jeffrey Feltman, uh, a State Department employee who was at that time uh, at the UN. Uh, and in, indeed, you, you know, most of you saw that, the, the South Korean Olympics, uh, all of that, and then eventually the Singapore summit, uh, people have criticized that Trump didn't get much. He got exactly what I think we needed, two things, normalization, and denuclearization. So that was the right step. Then unfortunately, between that, uh, you know, June of 2018 uh, and the February of 2019 with the Hanoi II Summit, both 
the American side and the North Korean side just did poorly. They just simply screwed up. The North Korean side screwed up because Kim Jong un did not give his negotiators uh, enough authority to work with Steve Began, uh, who was the American nuclear envoy, to try to prep things for the summit itself. So they were looking that Kim Jong un's going to go in, deal directly with Donald Trump. Well, it turns out there were these two guys here that stood between Steve Began and, and President. President Trump did want to make a deal. Uh, but uh, John Bolton, as he points out uh, in his book, the room where it happened, was proud of the fact that he managed to essentially to prompt Trump to walk away, that walking away was better for him. Uh, and then um, I must say, Secretary Pompeo, who I I'd always suspected, that, and I don't think he's too fond of those North Koreans, in his recent book, which is called Never Give an Inch, <laughs> he basically tells you that. So Steve Began had the right idea, great diplomat, uh, and Donald Trump more or less had the right idea, but he had no sense of how he could actually pull that off. And then there were two guys in between who managed to, to make sure that it didn't happen. Uh, what happened then is that Trump walked away. This is uh, Minister Lee and Madam Che, she was vice minister at the time. Uh, they essentially, they called a midnight news conference and said, you know, such an opportunity as what we offered at Hanoi will never come again. Uh, the pundits around the country, left and right, said Trump was right to walk away. I wrote a paper almost right after that and said, was he really? Uh, I thought it was a hinge point. And it was a hinge point. Again, we had a chance to get in. We did not have a chance to end the nuclear program at that point. The only chance we had was, can we move him in the direction? And when we didn't when we walked away. Then they just upped the gain uh, on the nuclear program. And so here's another one of these charts. That's what was at play in 2019. Uh, in, in the end, uh, we lost the ability uh, to get back in and they ramped things up. Uh, Kim Jong un uh, was very, very upset uh, and embarrassed. He tried one more time. They tried. They got together uh, in um, at the DMZ in June of that year, but it was essentially uh, it was too late. Time runs out. Biden administration comes in, uh, and the missile launches really go up uh, in that time, and that's in essence uh, where we are uh, today. I, I'm going to stop there because I got on long enough and be happy to answer any questions about this period of time also. But just to point out, so the hinge points, Stanford Uni University Press uh, brought it out in early January. Uh, and then uh, Ala Kasyanova, uh, my good colleague here, and one of our students, uh, Frank Quilly, uh, they put together this terrific website that sort of complements the book. And, and then since I've moved down part-time to Monterey Institute. It now resides and is available at Monterey Institute at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies. So let me leave it there. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, to those who are listening on, to those who are online, I'd simply remind you to submit your questions through the Q&A version, and I'll try to get to those questions. Um, but let's open it up to questions in the room. And following the tradition of CSAC, uh, I'll recognize first uh, fellows. So raise your hand if a fellow or student uh, would like to kick off the question. Don't be shy. Okay, please. And please identify yourself. Uh, I thank you very much uh, for an excellent talk. My name is uh, Ori Rabinowitz, a um, fellow here. I wanted to ask about uh, North Korea's successful attempt to export an entire nuclear reactor while it's uh, in deep engagement with the US and the US is 
allegedly trying to figure out what North, what North Korea is doing with its nuclear program. Uh, how do you think the North Koreans manage it in terms of uh, not being picked up by the US? Is this uh, some sort of, uh, or what kind of a US failure is it if it's all? What were they, what was the end game for them? And the, hey, Ron, I didn't uh, have enough hearing, difficulty hearing that. Right. Didn't quite catch the last. Uh, the, yeah. I think, correct me if my summary's uh, not quite right, but uh, how is it possible for the U.S. to not know about the development of a uh, nuclear reactor uh, in North Korea, right? Syria. Syria. Or oh, Syria. Syria, yeah. Or Syria or North Korea? Syria. And um, what was their end game yeah, yeah, with yeah. the Syrian reactor? Oops. Yes, please, Scott. Do you have a technical or... Um, do you have a technical or political explanation for why North Korea would uh, barter, I assume, or sell a graphite reactor to make plutonium rather than centrifuges to make uranium? Because I would think it was hard enough for the Israelis to figure out what was going on with this graphite reactor it would have been even harder to find a uranium enrichment facility in Syria. All right, so, so very good question. The, the answer, uh, Scott, to your question uh, is uh, they, they couldn't compete with AQ Khan and company. So they, they, at that point, they were in no position to actually export a, a uranium centrifuge facility. Uh, so they, they were still building up their own centrifuge capabilities they did not have the capability to actually go and build a turnkey operation someplace else, in my opinion. And certainly, if I were the Syrians, I wouldn't buy it uh, from the North Koreans because they had not demonstrated that. Of course, by 2007, or, or at least for 2007 is when that was destroyed. The, you know, the project started, uh, at least what, what some people indicate, it may have actually been signed uh, by the... Um, the older Assad, you know, the, the father back in 1999 or 2000, there's some indication that maybe ground was broken in 2001 or, or so. Uh, and so uh, certainly by that time, there was no way that the North Koreans could have supplied uranium centrifuge capabilities. Um, Khan, AQ Khan was still doing it at that time, but he didn't do it after 2004 uh, time frame. Uh, on the um, uh, on the end game of, of the um, uh, why why wouldn't the the U.S. Uh, know? Uh, it turns out that's what I tried to say by the comment. Not even the Israelis knew that. So not even the Mossad uh, knew that. So the 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 Syrians did this exceptional job uh, of subterfuge of how they put this together. Uh, and, and so, again, no fences, nothing of that nature. Uh, the U.S. later on, U.S. intelligence actually showed uh, that, yeah, they had some indication that there was some excavation and some activity in Syria at that point, but nobody suspected a, a nuclear reactor. And then the way that it was finally uh, constructed, it just it didn't look like a reactor. Uh, and then I think it wasn't until... The, um, the Syrians with the North Koreans help. So they had this reactor on the banks of the Euphrates River and they finally had to go down to the river uh, to, to get cooling water. And I guess that, that activity is what tipped off the Israelis somewhere in the early part of 2007. Uh, and so even the Israelis didn't know. So it's, it's not that surprising that the Americans didn't know. Of course, there was no reactor operating. There was no cooling tower. You know, there were no fences, uh, none of that. So it was a great job uh, on the combination of the Syrian and the North Korean reactors. The one thing that I mentioned uh, in the book uh, is, you know, what's still, this is still one of the, the great puzzles in, in my opinion, exactly why did they do that? And why would they, you know, try to sell the plutonium production reactor? They didn't, there was no indication at that time yet that they had a reprocessing facility. 
you know, so in other words, how are they going to extract the plutonium uh, from that uh, reactor fuel? Uh, there's a very interesting uh, piece from an ex-German uh, uh, Intel person uh, who uh, offered uh, his opinion uh, that this was actually an activity that was paid for uh, by the Iranians uh, to build a reactor uh, for plutonium for Iran. So I, I leave it with the following possibility. I'm not sure which it was. One possibility is just that, that, that the Iranians actually paid for the construction of, and eventually they were gonna get the plutonium. The second possibility is now the Syrians, you know, uh, they were gonna keep the plutonium, they were gonna build a reprocessing facility, which one can do in you know, 18 months to two year time frame. by the time they would have gotten uh, enough spent fuel. The third, which I can't fully rule out, is while they didn't make much plutonium anymore in North Korea, as I mentioned, the North Koreans actually used the Syrian reactor to make plutonium for themselves. Now, at that point, I wouldn't export the spent fuel rods to North Korea, that would be hard to do. But the plutonium, you know, I could take up in a, out in a couple of suitcases, that's pretty easy to hide. So we don't know that. And so that part of the story hasn't been written yet. We need more information either from Syria or North Korea, but the story of how the reactor was destroyed uh, is, is a fantastic book by uh, uh, Yaakov Katz. Uh, have you seen that one? It's called Shadow Strike. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a fantastic story uh, of how the Israelis went in uh, and actually destroyed that reactor. Let me stop there. All right. I've got several, two fingers. Uh, well, you have to wait in line. <laughs> I've got three, uh, two fingers. So Herb, okay, uh, Phil, now it's your turn. <laughs> so to Scott's question, uh, I had a conversation about this with Mike Hayden when I was still in my reporting life at the New York Times and he was the deputy director of uh, national intelligence. Uh, his explanation of why we didn't know about it is that we weren't looking for it. The satellites were focused on other parts of the world at that time. And so when you add that uh, <clears throat> to what Sig explained about the camouflaging of it, he just wrote it off as a, a failure of US uh, surveillance from space. Let, let me just uh, let me add one more piece, and, and I mentioned it. Uh, I mentioned it briefly uh, in the book, and uh, and let me mention it here, sort of in defense uh, to some extent uh, of the um, of the Bush administration. So, as you know, the Bush administration in the two thousand and three uh, decision uh, to go into Iraq because they had nuclear weapons, that was on their mind when this happened. Uh, and so in early 2007, I, I don't know, maybe springtime or so, when the Mossad first got uh, the wind that that's uh, what they were doing. Uh, so they, they informed the Americans uh, and uh, they gave a, a bunch of the information to the Americans. And so I was already here uh, at, uh, at CSAC, uh, but I still lived in Los Alamos, Santa Fe, and actually at that time still in Los Alamos. And so I, I got a call from a very high ranking military member uh, of the US government uh, who said, hey, Sig, we, we have some things we'd like to show you. And so when I went back uh, to spend the summer uh, in Los Alamos, uh, on the Los Alamos uh, little airport, I arrived the military plane uh, with a high ranking military member laying out these plans. This was now June. Uh, of, uh, of 2007 and said, Sig, what, what do you think? We don't wanna get burned again. <laughs> and so they were very concerned about either going in themselves, which Bush decided not to do, uh, or you know, helping the Israelis in some way. And my conclusion from what I was shown at that time uh, is Hey, from what they had, this is a reactor. I, I, later, I later went back to Langley when they had more information. And, and I have to give the CIA credit here. The job they did 
and putting the story together of why this was a nuclear reactor and why there was a North Korea uh, connection was really compelling. And I told them, I told them so. Right. Rose, you had two fingers, yeah? Okay, one. But if we could, Kate, could we turn up the gain in that just a little bit, you know, for me? Louder, is, that yeah. a, is that it? Okay. <laughs> I'll try to. Hello, Sig, Rose Gottemuller, and it's uh, really a fantastic book. I'm glad to see the final result. Um, my question has to do with Russia today. And obviously Russia and North Korea are in each other's embrace at the moment. We were always worried during the early years of uh, the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program that there would be brain drain from Russia to North Korea to assist their weapons of mass destruction and missile programs. Uh, do you think there'll be a new uh, burst in cooperation in this area between the Russian Federation and North Korea now? So um, a year and a half ago, I, I would have said no. Uh, I would have answered that no. Uh, and, and certainly, even though you didn't ask, uh, but, the, but let me step back, because a lot of people think, uh, and I, I didn't cover it here, but I covered it in the book, you know, the North Koreans couldn't have done all of that themselves. You know, they must have had help, and most likely it was Russia or China that helped them with the bomb. Russia or China did not help them directly with the bomb. Uh, I got great entree to the Russians and the Chinese because they said, you were there, we've never been there. <laughs> uh, and, and so, um, uh, I, my view was that the, the Russian nuclear complex, and, and as you know, I know those, those people well, uh, they had never worked uh, with the, the North Koreans. The missile complex, I believe, has, uh, including quite recently. And so it was very two different parts uh, of the Russian system. Uh, missile, yes, and then particularly after the demise of the Soviet Union, even the Ukrainians uh, and, and the Russians. Uh, and, but I, I still thought, uh, you know, maybe on the missile side somewhat, but I didn't think that was going to be a big problem. Uh, so today that's different because the part that I didn't say that I left uh, is, is essentially where we are now. And this allows me in answer to your question, uh, give you the rest of the story, which is where I believe for 30 years uh, that the uh, North Koreans we're truly interested in trying to reach normalization with the United States that it's over, uh, that they had another pattern break. And that pattern break is sort of the last year or two. Whereas in 1990, they decided to look to the United States. They've now decided, nope, uh, we're gonna go back with China and Russia. Uh, and so what that will bring in a new arrangement, uh, what, what the, North Koreans, and, and you know that, what they've said publicly related to Ukraine, I mean, it's, it's just outrageous. I mean, it is really, really outrageous. And so would they now actually link up in some fashion? Again, I wouldn't have expected the, the, the Russian nuclear complex to come out in any way, but with what Putin has done following Ukraine, uh, I, I don't put anything off the table anymore. I'm very much concerned about that. I actually feel, feel better about the Chinese. I think the Chinese would have more restraint th than in, in working with, again, the Chinese nuclear people have never helped the North Korean nuclear program directly. Uh, but, and I still feel that way about the Chinese, but I don't feel that way about the Russians anymore. I'm not sure. Good question. Herb? I think that was a fantastic talk. Um, and you, you more, louder, more or less, louder. Right, you more or less answered my question um, just now. But just to make sure I understood it, you know, it sounds like you think that there's nothing that the U.S. can do at this point to pursue with denuclearization or or less nuclearization of uh, of North Korea. Then I, I think that's what you said. Is that right? Um, no, not 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 quite. Uh, so, uh, in um, when the Biden administration took over. You know, one of the things, again, I didn't mention it much here, I pretty much cover it in, in the book, uh, but, you know, since, since I'm the, the, the scientist type, I, I, I've worked with all of the administrations, and, and I've had good access to all of the administrations, including the Trump administration. So I, I've worked with all of them, and so whenever I've gone to North Korea, I did an analysis, I always, my view is always, I shared with the government first. 
you know, I want them to make sure to understand because in the end, you'd like to be able to influence the policy. Uh, and that means you got to work uh, uh, with, with the people in power. So I've, I've worked with them. So when, when the Biden administration took over, even before they took over in, in December uh, of 2020, I, I knew a number of the key individuals that were gonna go into the national security slots quite well, uh, personally. Uh, and so I send them a piece and I said, okay, I look for what it's worth. You guys know I've done a lot of work in North Korea. Here, here's what I would suggest you do. You, you know, things, uh, Hanoi was, was really bad, uh, you know, Kim was in Bur uh, embarrassed. You got to move out fast uh, and, and do something. And of course, as Rose shakes her head, you have to do a policy review, you know, five, six months later, you got nothing. And of course, the world then changed dramatically. So nothing happened. So now what to do? It turns out I was just uh, in contact with uh, a high level US government uh, official uh, this, um, this Monday. Uh, and uh, he asked me that question. And I said, look, what, what, what it takes now is, is a fundamental rethink of, of US North Korea policy. What we've done has failed. They've turned the switch, you know, and have moved away for normalization at this particular time. But we also know from previous history that, that the North Koreans are pretty pragmatic. You know, as things change, they take a different approach. And so actually uh, in the spirit uh, uh, of our colleague, uh, Bill Perry here, what I suggested Bill uh, was what you need to do, not to do another nuclear policy review and take six months, you need to do a Perry process. You, you need to just face up that what we're doing doesn't work, treat North Korea the way that it is, try to bring a few people together that can lay out some potential paths as I think at this point, just continue to go in and say, you know, North Korea must denuclearize. That's also my view. The, you know, the end result has to be there, but they're not going to start through that. You, you have to somehow try to get at the essence. What do they want to talk about now? I mean, what, what, what are their security concerns? What do we need to do? Uh, Bill, in, in, in his process uh, in the 1998-1990 time uh, frame, went around, look at all the different places, then eventually at the end went to North Korea uh, and then you know, gave his report uh, back to uh, US. That's the only hope that I have for now. I, I think there's nothing uh, you know, that the, North, that the uh, administration could just pull out of a hat that's gonna work right now. Right, let me uh, just ask a question that's uh, come in uh, over the web uh, from Mr. Schaefer. Are there any lessons from the North Korean story to be implemented in our relationship with Iran? Iran? I've given a number of talks, and as you might imagine, I've tried to sort of um, aim each one at, at the audience. This is why this was the CSAC, you know, uh, Stanford talk. But that question I've gotten every time, <laughs> uh, and, and the you know the interesting thing is. So the, the lessons, if you look at what happened in Iran, uh, it, was, it was very, very different in terms of, of my complaint on North Korea. Uh, I say here that the technical people uh, did not get an entree into the political process. So in other words, uh, even though, I mean, our government had the technical information. I mean, I for one, even though I'm not, I wasn't a government employee, I took all that information into the government. So it, it was not for ignorance of what was there, but that technical information, the cautions, the thinking that you would have to do never got seriously entered into the political process. Well, it turns out in Iran, it did. And, and that is Ernie Moniz, Secretary of Energy, uh, who's high powered technical guy, knows what's going on. He sat there next to John Kerry at all of these deliberations with the Iranians. And the Iranians had Salehi there, the head of the Iranian uh, you know, uh, Atomic Energy Organization. Uh, and he was actually an MIT graduate, so they could do, talk technical stuff. So they did make a technically informed decision, uh, which 
uh, at that time, that was sort of the best that you could do. And, and by the way, Ernie brought me back several times also, showed me the Iran stuff, said, you know, Sig, what do you think? And for instance, my, my view was, if they're willing to kill that plutonium reactor in Iran, that's a big deal, you know, take, take that. Uh, in terms of the rest, I wasn't too worried about the timelines and so forth. Uh, so I thought at that point they made the right decision, uh, and you know, for what it was worth, when they asked me, I said, you know, that that seemed to be a good technically informed uh, decision. What I didn't know at the time, and I'm not sure uh, Ernie and John Kerry did either, uh, was all the details of Project Ahmad, uh, and that's the stuff uh, that not Netanyahu laid out when the Israeli Mossad again you know, raided a warehouse and brought out all this information where the Iranians had everything lined up, not just to build a bomb. My view was they could build a bomb, you know, in a couple of months time frame where they were in 2015. Uh, what I didn't realize, they had not only the plan for the bomb, but they had everything, a plan for a nuclear arsenal. Uh, and, and that brought out enough information that today I would have concern about going back to that. But the process was very different. The Obama administration brought the technical people in. They affected the political process, which is, I think is our technical uh, technical folks like me. That's sort of the best you can hope for. We're nearing the end, but Tom, you had a question. Thank you, Sig. That was terrific. Hinge points don't just happen. <laughs> What have you learned from this experience that we need to do in order to bring about another uh, possibility? And I, I would say first is to set realistic goals for US policy that we had in my judgment, unrealistic goals uh, dealing in several steps with North Korea. Preventing acquisition of nuclear weapons is no longer realistic. Rollback, probably not realistic. But what are the US goals that we can realistically pursue? Yeah, so uh, of course, I mean, Tom, you, you're right. And, and uh, you were there where you had to give that sort of input, including to avoid the hinge point in the first place. You know, how, how do we avoid the hinge point? Uh, we've had now for a long time, we've had the unrealistic goals uh, with um, uh, with North Korea, uh, you know, just focus on the denuclearization. Bob Carlin the other day uh, sent me a list uh, of um, sort of the latest ten State Department's pronouncements about what we're willing to do with North Korea, <laughs> and quite frankly, it, it's it's pathetic. I mean, they all say denuclearization, and they say, of course, we're willing to talk, but you know, denuclearization. I mean, that's got to come, and, and that's just not not going to get us there. So the realistic goals today, and I've been thinking a lot about that in, in terms of North Korea. Uh, there are a number of people who for a while uh, promoted that we need to take an arms control type of approach. Okay, I, I don't like that because arms control is, you know, Soviet Union, uh, US, uh, two equally, uh, you know, capable uh, adversaries. That's not the situation with North Korea. But something more along the line uh, of, of crisis uh, avoidance, uh, of risk reduction, uh, uh, of going in and say, look at this point, whether we like it or not, you know, these guys, I, I didn't show the one chart I had, you know, where are they today? Uh, they have somewhere around 50 kilograms of plutonium, you know, give or take a little, but maybe as much as a thousand kilograms of highly enriched uranium. That stuff is not as potent as the plutonium, but it's pretty good for the short range uh, you, know, you know, missiles and so forth. So that they have uh, that capability. And so um, that's, it's a huge, huge concern in terms of the damage that can be done in, in South Korea and Japan. Uh, and we still have all of these potential problems uh, of, you know, misperceptions, uh, miscommunications and all of these problems. So we should get more serious. The realistic goal today is make sure we don't have a goddamn nuclear exchange on the Korean Peninsula. That's first and foremost. So that's what we ought to focus on. And there ought to be a way to talk to the North Koreans without us actually saying, hey, look, it's okay for you to have the nuclear weapons. That's sort of the best I can do. All right, on that note, 
uh, we're near, we're at the end of the, the time. So uh, what I'd like to do is invite everyone to a reception that's just outside here and end by thanking once again, Sig, for really a magnificent- <laughs>